Hey guys, I'm back. Um, my old place, in my old, my old video room here. Um, decided to do a, you know, I'm trying to come on here maybe once a week and do a video. Um, I don't have a lot of stuff prepared. It's not my usual tales from the garage, unfortunately. I, I will get back to them ASAP. Um, what's going on right now is that um, if you go back five days from today, um, you may have seen my video that I filmed in my living room of uh, me playing some music um, during Monday's eclipse. Not that there was much eclipse to see on my video anyway. Um, but, um, as a result of that, I had to take a lot of my equipment, um, even from here in my bedroom, um, and also my stair, uh, my garage and use that equipment to film the video. So all that equipment is still in the living room and, um, I can't do a tales from, I can't film in the garage right now because of that. Um, I've got like my mixer from here that I used to record music here, uh, out there. So I can't record any music either. Um, and I've got computer and stuff like that. That was in the garage is now in the living room. Um, so, you know, it makes life a little difficult, um, in, in terms of filming videos. I really like filming the videos in the garage and, um, you know, I'm going to get back to those because we're going to run out of time in terms of the cold weather settling in and there's no heat out there. Um, so I'm going to get back to those and hopefully get a couple months before the winter really, before, well, before the cold air really settles in and I can't uh, film out there anymore um, until late March or April. So today um, I'm back here in my old spot. Um, that I, you know, will be from time to time making videos. Um, talk a little bit about John Abercrombie. I did a kind of dedication, but it was just a, me flipping through some of the albums I have by him and ended up missing half of them um, that I actually have. You know, after you make a video, you realize, oh, I got him on this album, I got him on that album. But I just wanted to do a little dedication. The video got banned in, in, uh, in Europe and Germany specifically, I know, because I didn't speak on that video. I just did a, um, I took a track from my favorite John Abercrombie album, Characters, and um, I guess the, you know, the, the, the ECM and the, you know, the record label and the copyright and all that stuff uh, blocked it in Europe. I'm surprised they didn't block it in America because it's essentially available in America, technically, I guess, as a download, but they're not printing them up anymore, sadly. Um, I'm really bummed out um, by John Abercrombie's passing, which I didn't see coming. <clears throat> see, I was unaware that he had canceled gigs recently due to illness. So all I know is he was still recording albums. He had a band. He was doing live concerts. Um, so I really figured he would be around for a while. I kind of, I kind of thought he would be one of those Dave Brubeck guys, you know, playing into their nineties. So it's quite sad, you know, obviously, uh, and, and being one of my all time favorite musicians, I, you know, and, and since his passing, I thought who, who could not replace him, but who's somebody that's very close in style to him? Cause he did play some standards, you know, uh, he made them his own, but he was mostly a you know, composer himself. And, you know, most of the things he played, he wrote himself or in his quartet, somebody in his, in his quartets that he had might write it. Um, and he played, you know, okay, a lot of people know him from Timeless, which was the, his first solo album in the early seventies, which was a little bit of fusion in there. Um, depending on how far back you go with him, you know, when he played with the Brecker brothers and with Billy Cobham, that was a bit more of a fusion side of him. But that's not so much what he's well known for, not really what he developed into. And what he developed into, I, you know, by the time of the, of the late 70s, say by 76 or so, he had this kind of unique style in terms of how he played and how he composed. Um, 
and I can't think of anybody that you could replace him with or, or that's close enough to him. There's a couple guys, uh, guys only, and the only guy I can think of offhand really is from his own generation is uh, Mick Goodrick, who doesn't record a lot of albums that I'm aware of, and the ones he does are fairly hard to come by. He did do one solo album for ECM around seven, 1978, I want to say it was. But he's mainly been a, a teacher. And I think he's a teacher at, 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 uh, at Berkeley in Boston, but I'm not sure, uh, which is where Gary Burton is. Um, so it's kind of like the Mick Goodrick albums that come out are sandwiched in between his, his main gig. And I've got a handful of them, uh, mostly European labels. Um, and he's a guy that, that, um, I think he comes from the same place as Abercrombie. Well, he, he will record a standard on occasion, um, but he writes a lot of his own stuff. He's done, uh, at times, a slight fusion edge to his music. But a lot of people cite him, I think correctly, as being a very heavy influence on early Pat Metheny. Um, and that real clean Pat Metheny sound that you heard on his on Pat Metheny's earliest albums, like the first one or two two group albums and his first couple solo albums. Uh, I'm not sure if Metheny studied with Mick Goodrick or not, um, but you know, by the same token, I can't see Mick Goodrick making an album like Characters from John Abercrombie. So anyway, just reflecting on on John Abercrombie. And I don't know if you noticed, I've got some posters, courtesy of Carm. Thank you very much, Carm, that are hanging here. Um, Carm sent me a whole bunch of stuff, and, I'm, and um, I want to thank him because Carm is the real kind of like gentleman prince of the VC. He's, got, he's always sending tons of stuff out to people, and um, and I got a huge package from him, and uh, it was really really sweet. A lot of great stuff and a lot of things. Um, that he knows I like that aren't even necessarily music things. Um, but anyway, you know, with this whole John Abercrombie thing, obviously I've been thinking about him. Uh, he didn't live too far from here. He lived in a, in a I think in a suburb or, or of, uh, of New York City, and I live right on the cusp of, of the New York borderline. Um, I know Jack Deschanel lives in Woodstock. Woodstock's about an hour from me, but I think Abercrombie lives even closer, or lived much, much closer. Um, so in a way, it stings a little bit because it's, it's, it's it maybe a little bit more because one of those things that, I, you know, driving my car, if I would go on a highway or something like that, I always have my eye out for guys that look like Jen Abercrombie and uh, Jack Dijonet because they're, you know, because they were guys that lived in the area. And they travel through this area to get into New York City if they have a gig to play. And I'm fairly sure they're probably very familiar with the roads, you know, at least the highways that go around here. Um, so I was thinking, you know, back, and, I've, you know, I've probably already discussed this in an earlier video or several different videos. How did I get into John Abercrombie? And um, it was only really, I have to take two steps back because my discovery of John Abercrombie came um, fairly early in my discovery of ECM Records. Prior to discovering ECM Records, I don't think I had any jazz at all, of any type. I had gone through a phase, as soon as I got out of high school, I kind of discovered things that were no longer rock music. Um, and at first I got into um, more obscure European uh, progressive rock artists of the late 70s um, and people you know whose albums at the time weren't even released in America like Gong um, and uh, even much much more obscure bands than Gong um, and then discovered Klaus Schultz and Tangerine Dream and all that but there's real no kind of correlation I think between like the, the Berlin electronic scene and these obscure like French prog bands and jazz, not 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 really. I, I I don't think. I think they're kind of separate. There's not too many musicians that have crossed over um, one into the other. 
Um, but back then, in the late 70s, it was 77, 78 in there, there's no internet to hear clips of music, no Amazon to hear clips of music, or even, you know, people putting up albums and songs up in full to find out what an artist sounded like. So I was a nut, and I subscribed to any magazine at all that had record reviews in there. You know, I had tons of magazine subscriptions. Uh, one of my favorites being... And now uh, um, a magazine that I'm sure is no longer printed called Record Review, which was really great. Um, it reviewed everything in sections. All it was was album reviews of new albums or reissued albums. And, you know, one section was, you know, pop rock and the current stuff. And another section was jazz and classical and, you know, whatever they called world music back then, or ethnic music or whatever. And, um, you know, I would read anything and everything I could, you know, uh, looking for things that interested me. And I, I'm not sure if it was in record review. It probably was that I, I first read of um, this new release, which was an album by Bar Phillips I've discussed before called Three Day Moon. That was a new release. This was recorded in um, March of 78 and came out, probably came out in late 78. Um, and I actually had to visit, now I didn't, I, I just went by the description in the review of what it sounded like. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really interesting. You know, never heard of the musician before, never heard of Bar Phillips, never heard of ECM Records before, um, knew nothing about anything. Um, and, but the review made the album sound like it was something I would be interested in. And I went and I looked in records, several record stores and couldn't find any album by him. Now, the odd thing is, I don't know why, but I didn't look in the jazz section. I looked in rock because it sounded to me like it was kind of like an instrumental prog thing, maybe. Um, I looked in rock. I, I even looked in classical. But I guess in my mind at the time, not knowing really much about jazz, I guess I was thinking, you know, like, 1940s swing bands and Charlie Parker was jazz or something like that. And, you know, the synthesizer heavy kind of avant-garde music, I didn't think would ever be classified as jazz. Finally, I figured, well, I got this review. It doesn't say that it's an import album. It, you know, the, the review uh, in the, in, you know, in those record review uh, magazines were pretty much for records that you could get, you know, that were available in America. So I'm like, well, you know, I've got all these huge record stores that, you know, have thousands and thousands of albums. How come I can't get this? So eventually I did the, you know, the, the desperate thing, and I actually asked the salesperson. Um, and they brought me over to the jazz section, and, and there it was. I bought it in a, in a chain that doesn't exist anymore called Harmony Hut. Uh, I can remember the night I bought it. Brought it home, and for once it was everything that I thought it would be from, from reading the interview, and I hoped it would be. And again, I had, this is my first ECM album. Uh, this, is, this is my gateway drug ECM album. I had um, never heard of any of the musicians involved. So it's the first time I heard Bar Phillips, the upright bassist. It's the first time I heard uh, Dieter Feichner, the synthesizer player, who I was not able to get another Dieter Feichner uh, solo album, album as a leader, until like two years ago. It's a long stretch. Um, this is the first time I ever heard Trila Gertu play. He plays percussion on this. And this is probably a very, very early session for Trila Gertu, who must have been very young when, when he did the session in 1978. Because his name didn't really crop up for another, another few years. Eventually, I did see him, you know, as a sideman on other ECM recordings, but it took a while for him to to pop up, so he was very early in his career here. And of course, Terje Ripto on guitar and guitar synthesizer. This is my introduction to all of those musicians, including Terje Ripto. So, I loved this album so much, it was only natural for me to, to, to go out and look for more. Uh, and again, no reference, there's no discogs, no catalogs I could use, just, just going to the record store. So I looked for album. I loved all. I love this album so much. I looked for albums by any of these guys. Uh, Tree Locker too. There was nothing. This is long before he he ever did a solo album. Dieter Feichner, nothing. There's only a couple things in in Europe many years later. Terje Ripto, I found. Um, 
and here's where the gateway to ECM becomes a thing. Uh, so because at that point, I don't think I had found another Bar Phillips album. I did find a Teji Ripto album. There were several. I, I'm pretty sure this is the first one I picked up, which is Teji Ripto, Miroslav Vitas, and Jack DeJanet. Uh, from recorded June in 78. So it's only recorded three months after the Bar Phillips Three Day Moon album. And again, this is the first time that I heard uh, Jack DeJanet uh, on drums and uh, the first time I heard Miroslav Vitas on bass and keyboards. And this is a great album. This is one of the best things I think Terry Ripple ever did. Um, and I didn't quite understand the drumming style at first. I was coming from a a place where the drums just held down a solid rhythm, not this more abstract type of playing. And at first I didn't understand it. It's not that I didn't like it, I didn't understand it. Uh, now, like I've said a million times before, I'm glad he plays the way he does on this album, and kind of John Christensen style. Um, if he had played more of a solid rock backing, I wouldn't be listening to this album anymore, I don't think. I think I would have tired of it long ago. But it's this kind of orchestral drumming, you know, where you build tension and you know, there's lots of dynamics building up and down. And, you know, a lot of a lot of very cool cymbal work. And of course the drums are so excellently recorded on this, the whole album is really, that every, anything else that I would pick up after this, you know, that was, you know, that was instrumental music that I listened to you know, the way it was recorded, I was always disappointed because these ECM engineers, man, they really got the sound down. And it's like, how can they not record the drums better on these other recordings where you would like hear the snare and occasionally the bass drum and that was it. You know, this is just, you know, this, even though this was recorded in 78, there's still like a, a book in here on how to record, especially how to record acoustic drums. So, you know, I went here very quickly after the Bar Phillips album. Uh, and so this is my introduction to Miroslav Vitas and Jack DeJanet. So you can see now I got a couple more artists that I'm interested in based on the fact that I love that album so much. Then I found the only other album that was really available at the time by Bar Phillips that was actually out in the record stores was this earlier album that I did find right after that, uh, Mountainscapes which was his prior album to uh, Three Day Moon. And this one was recorded in, in March of 76, so exactly two years uh, before Three Day Moon. And again, this had um, Dieter Feitschner again on synthesizer. So it's the second album I have by Bar Phillips that's got Dieter Feitschner on synthesizer. So for once, there's a musician I was a little familiar with. Um, it's the first time I heard Stu Martin on drums. Stu Martin didn't do a lot of ECM sessions, but he did do a lot of work with Bar Phillips uh, in a, a trio with John Sermon. And John Sermon plays on here. It's the first time I heard of John Sermon, too. Another ECM artist with a lot of albums. So, boom, I got more people to put on my list because I love this album as well. The interesting thing with this album is that on one track, on the very last track of the album, there is a guest musician. The, the basic album is the four musicians, Mar Phillips on bass, John Sermon playing um, saxophones and synthesizer, Dieter Feitschner on synthesizer, Stu Martin on drums and synthesizer as well. Um, but in the last track, John Abercrombie comes and plays an improvised solo for a few minutes on just the last track. Even listening to it, you can tell it was improvised. It's very effective. I loved it. And, for, you know, listening to it in the context of Bar Phillips music, completely different sound than what Terzi Riptal had played with Bar Phillips on, on the Three Day Moon album. This was a lot cleaner. A lot cleaner, less less sustain, and the, the kind of less processing sound. And I really liked um, what John played on here. And and again, it was uh, I, I only read decades later that John was uh, in the in the same studio recording another album for ECM, and Manfred Eicher, producer, ECM's producer, and guiding light. Um, came up with the idea of asking John to come and play a solo, and I guess ran it by Bar Phillips and said, hey, you know, there's this guy here. Why don't you come and, you know, and improvise a solo and, and play on a track on his album? So the idea actually came from Manfred. 
So thanks, Manfred, because that's how I discovered John Abercrombie. And even though it was just a solo, he doesn't really play throughout the whole song. He just plays the solo. I really dug the style. Again, you know, I was just getting into Tejy Riptal. Tejy Riptal was a little bit more in the in the processed rock world that I had come from. And as much as I liked it, I was also looking for other things. And um, so as a result of this, you know, uh, John Sermon's on here. I got to find out about this guy who recorded many albums for ECM. And uh, Dieter Feitschner was on here again. But again, I couldn't find any Dieter Feitschner albums. But I sure could find John Abercrombie albums. Um, so, and I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure of the order. I know I bought these two albums very close to each other. So I'm not 100% sure which one came first. I think it was this one. I decided to get a John Abercrombie album, and I chose uh, Gateway 2, which I love. And this was my introduction to Dave Holland. Now, I and uh, Jack DeJanette is the third person in the trio. Now, Jack DeJanette, I had heard on the Terje Riptal, Miroslav Vitas, Jack DeJanette album. So I was already familiar with his style a little bit. So now here's a chance to hear him in a much more acoustic kind of setting with Dave Holland's upright bass and John Abercrombie. And I think this was my first John Abercrombie album, really. And it's an interesting choice um, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, John didn't wasn't in love with this album so much, but I don't think he listened to it for years either. The interesting thing with this album to me is um, side two is all, everybody contributes. Every of the three musicians, everybody writes pieces. Um, so the second side consists of um, one track by Dave Holland, one track by Jack Dijonet, where Dijonet actually plays piano and, and no drums at all, which is a really pretty, one of my favorite Jack Dijonet tracks ever called Blue. Real pretty ballad. And John Abercrombie has a composition on side two. And there's a, another short Dave Holland composition on uh, side one, which is only four and a half minutes long, which has John Abercrombie playing acoustic guitar. But the first over six, 16 and minutes and 17 seconds of side one is a group improvisation. It takes balls to open an album with a 16 minute improvisation um, called Opening, credited naturally to all three musicians. Now, for those people that are familiar with this album and that track, um, it took me years of really listening to John Abercrombie's music to, to figure something out. One thing I couldn't figure out when I listened to opening is um, you have Jack on drums, Dave Holland in upright bass, and I thought John Abercrombie was playing guitar on here because he's listed as playing acoustic and electric guitars and electric mandolin. But I could never understand why an opening for the entire 16 minutes, you never hear any guitar chords or any playing uh, lower on the neck, you know, where the thicker, fatter guitar chords are. Everything sounded like it was being played, just, just single note phrases, improvising, on the very high end of the guitar neck for all 16 minutes. And I couldn't figure out, well, how come he's not playing any chords or, uh, you know, down low on the neck, you know, even in the mid-range of the guitar or the lower end of the guitar? Well, the reason, and it took me a few years to figure this out, is because there's no guitar on this track, the entire thing that, that John is playing is the tiny little electric mandolin, which only really pretty much has a high end to it. Everything is done on that track on mandolin. So it's real interesting because you've got the bass and the drums all the way at the low end, the mandolin all the way at the high end, and this sonic area, which is usually occupied by piano or you know regular guitar, in the middle, there's no real middle. It's a fascinating track to me, um, still to this day, even though I've listened to it hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, and it's just an improvisation. But I finally did figure out that, well, the reason that he doesn't play down on the neck is because there is no down on the neck. It's not a guitar. It's a mandolin. And of course, you know, after years of listening to um, him play his electric mandolin on his records, you, you learn what the range of the instrument is. It's, got, it's kind of limited in terms of the, you know, the range. It's not like a piano or a guitar. Um, but I was totally fascinated that he chose to, to do that. You know, this big, long, sprawling 16-minute track, and there's no guitar. Very, very interesting. 
And I think I, I think that was the first one I picked up by him. But very shortly afterwards, I picked up this one, which is, you know, what I consider his masterpiece and my favorite album he ever did, which was Characters, which is the only one that he ever did all solo, just him. And in fact, there's more acoustic guitar on this album than in any other album he ever played on. Um, every track has acoustic guitar pretty much as the bed um, that the electric mandolin or the electric guitar solos over. Sometimes there's not even an electric guitar in there. I love his acoustic playing, but he really didn't do enough of it for my tastes. But the writing, he wrote all the tracks on there. Eight tracks, it's about 45 minutes. Um, and there's only three instruments on here. And the interesting thing is, for me, you know, if you listen to a solo piano album or any solo instrument or solo classical guitar or whatever, a lot of times you get tired of hearing, you know, the sameness of the sound um, by the end of the album. It's like, oh, okay, I've had enough of listening to solo piano or solo guitars or whatever. But with only three instruments, to me, there's enough variation here because of the way he mixes the acoustic and electric sound and the sound of the electric mandolin that I don't get tired for 45 minutes. I'll get tired of hearing it because some tracks are purely acoustic. Some tracks have a little bit more of an of electric, electronic feel to them slightly. Um, and there's just enough variation. And plus the, the tunes themselves, there's a lot of several, well, there's eight tracks, but there's at least like four ballady things on there that are really pretty shorter tracks, but they're mixed amongst these longer, more epic pieces um, that I, I just keep, you know, when, when I listen to this album, especially, you know, right from the, the, the first track called Parable, which is uh, 10 and a half minutes long, and it starts off, interestingly, with a mandolin solo, an electric mandolin solo, before all the other instruments drop in. There's several, three or four minutes of just electric mandolin playing live, like no overdubs, before like all these acoustic guitars and things come in. So right off the bat, it really starts off interesting. And and yet there's only three instruments on there. There's only a six string electric, six string acoustic, and the electric mandolin. And boy, I never recorded November 1977. I never get tired of listening to it. Never. And uh, a couple other favorites. Um, that as an outgrowth of, you know, this whole bar, this one Mar Phillips album that I bought, all these musicians came out of there. I now had Jack DeJeanette on a couple albums. I had him on the um, Terry G. Riptal, Miroslav Vitas, Jack DeJeanette album. And now I had him on the Gateway 2 album. And because solo albums, like characters, are my very favorite thing in the world, I then found this Jack DeJeanette Pictures uh, album which was recorded in February, I think, February 76. And it's uh, half and half. It's half Jack DeJeanette solo, doing you know all the instrumental parts, keyboards and drums, and three of the tracks, which is about half of the album, ha are duets with John Abercrombie. Well, I was familiar with both of these guys, so this was a, this was a I, I can't lose situation for me. Very interesting album. I think this is an album that maybe a lot of people wouldn't like because the music is uh, a bit out there in, in some cases, but I, it's one of my favorites to this day. It's one of my favorite albums. It's one of my favorite Jack DeJeanette albums. Um, and just having Jack DeJeanette and John Abercrombie play together, like I said, solos, you know, solo albums where a musician goes in and records all the parts himself through overdubbing are my favorite kind of albums. Next would probably be duo albums, you know, just two musicians. And so this is kind of both of those. So I know that was an early ECM buy. And another early ECM buy because of my um, love of John Abercrombie's characters, especially, and because there was no, there was never characters to follow up is you know, after a while, so I bought the, the next best thing, which is also probably my number two favorite John Abercrombie album, if you want to consider it a John Abercrombie album, at Sargasso Sea, which I like much better than the follow-up five years later, to be honest. Um, they did an album five years later called Five Years Later. But um, right before uh, John did the um, Characters album, 
he recorded this album in duet with guitarist Ralph Towner, Sargasso C. So this one was recorded in, in May of 70, 1976. May 76. Uh, love it. Love this album. Um, tons of atmosphere, just like, just like characters. Tons of atmosphere. Um, even though there's two guitarists on here, um, for me, short album, it's 41 minutes. I don't get tired of it because there's enough um, swapping of instruments with Ralph playing 12 string and classical guitars and John playing the electric mandolin, the electric guitar, and acoustic guitar. The, the great thing with this, which you can't, on uh, most uh, duet albums of guitarists, there's always going to be some tracks where you can't tell who's playing what. But none of, none of these guys play the same instrument at the same time. And Ralph doesn't play any electric guitar. So on any given track, it's always clear who's playing what. Even on the track that John's playing acoustic steel string guitar, Ralph is playing nylon string guitar. And on all the other tracks, you've got John playing either the electric mandolin or electric guitar, and Ralph playing his 12 string and his classical guitars. So there's, I think it's the only, besides the, the follow up album that they did together, the only time I've got a, a, a duet album of guitars where you could clearly know every second who's playing what. Um, it's a great album full of atmosphere, too, like I love. Again, from May 1976. And the nice touch with this, I think that doesn't make me tired of hearing guitars by the end of it, is Ralph does play a little bit of acoustic piano on, I think it's only two tracks. That has a little, a little touch, a little overdub of acoustic piano. But it really, really adds. It really, as subtle and minute as it is, it really adds to the overall vibe of, of, of the pieces that it's featured on. Now I want to go listen to this. So, uh, you know, those are my, those are my favorites. Uh, John Abercrombie albums. I went back to Bar Phillips just to show you how I got into all this. I think most people in the, in the, in the, in the VC probably get into music the same way. You know, there's, there's casual music fans will buy an album by an artist and as much as they love it, they never really look at who's playing on the album to figure out that, oh, well, it's really this guy's contribution to the album is it's what's making me dig this album so much. Um, but, you know, in the case of ECM, I bought one album, you know, that, that was all I intended on buying back in 1978. And just from loving the music and looking at the musicians on there, it just fanned out. You could see, you know, and you could see from here. And these, you know, I kind of did this as a dedication to John, but also... Um, to show you how I got into the whole ECM family. Um, so I, you know, I took that extra step back to my, my Bar Phillips, my very first ECM album. But all those that I just showed are really my, uh, you know, amongst my first ECM, uh, well, they are my first ECM purchases. Um, and you know how every time, you know, that then I got, I got Ralph Towner from the Sargasso Sea album and started buying Ralph Towner albums and it never ends. It still hasn't ended. How many years later? Almost 40 years later. Um, so, um, yeah. I thought I would just come on and, and, and chat. And again, didn't mean to go on for so long. Um, I'll, 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 I'm trying to, uh, I guess I have to dismantle my recording setup. I, I, I haven't decided yet if I want to try to do another live music video or record a live music video in the living room before I have to dismantle that stuff and bring it back uh, into the garage and into here or not. So, um, but I kind of wanted to do a regular in-person video. I want to, you know, aim for once a week. I want to get back to doing them in the garage, um, you know, as long as, you know, because I've only got a couple of months that the weather's going to permit. But uh, for now, you know, we're back here in my old, my old main room to do videos in. And um, I hope there was something in this video worth watching. Oh, and I'm going to include in my, in my little comment description setting a really good interview that I uh, just watched for the third time uh, with John Abercrombie that was recorded, I want to say, about uh, three or about four years ago. But when you look at his career, yeah, I think it was about 68 um, when he recorded it and he was 72 and he passed away early this week. Um, 
and it's just a really uh, a fun hour long interview that I just watched again and again. Um, and I'll include the link for that just in case uh, folks are interested and they haven't seen it and it didn't pop up in a you know previously in a YouTube suggestion box for them. So I'm going to include a link for that in my description box at the bottom of the video. And I'll be back real soon, guys. So thanks for watching.